first of all, I read that you had to take 18 trains to get here. <laughs> no, um, no, it wasn't 18. It wasn't, yeah. No, I mean, to be honest, we, we went to Hamburg first, and then we took um, an overnight bus okay. to Copenhagen. Then Copenhagen, there was the Snelltoget thing, uh, which, you know, what is it, 50 minutes to Malmö, stayed in Malmö, and then took the train from Malmö to Stockholm South because they have the roadworks and they're extending the line and then a bus. So what is that? One, two, three, five or six. It's not so bad. It was okay. It was okay. It was yeah. Perfect. Better than 18 trains. It's better than 18 trains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so you have been writing a book about the effects of life in the, in the or, or life in the effects of climate change, I should say. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the book? Sure. I mean, it's um, so the, the plot itself is really just a it's a framework on which to hang different ideas about what it means to be a human being. After after we've severed our connection to nature effectively. So I was very when I was writing, it, I was very obsessed with Henry David Thoreau, who wrote Walden in 1700 and something where he went and lived in the forest on his own to be completely self sustainable and um, uh, find himself in nature. He has this really great quote uh, that says, um, in wildness is the preservation of the world. Like we need this wildness. We can't take nature and just um, cut it up into little pieces, bite-sized pieces and, and, and keep it hermetically sealed. It needs to have room to grow. And um, my idea was that uh, it's a world where we've we've poisoned the world against us and now the world no longer needs us it's turned its back on us so what does that make us are we still human beings and my thesis is that once you get rid of these social structures infrastructure once you get rid of the um, kind of collaborative effort between human beings and once you get rid of this uh, spiritual connection to nature then we're no longer human we're just beings um, geared towards survival and I think as intelligent beings, then that's not enough for us. And then that's the idea of hope that comes in is like, if we act now, then we can still preserve us, who we are as human beings. Um, so that's the idea. I mean, the plot itself is two guys driving um, from point A to point B, delivering medical supplies. And they're basically talking, that's it. And talking and getting into trouble and uh, fighting inclement weather and fighting other people and it's basically what's happening now that's what that's what we're doing now right it's, we're not pulling in the same direction we're looking after ourselves it's looking after number one uh, it's very selfish and surprisingly once they find a way to work together then they reach their goal and that's that's it um, in what way do you think communicating climate crisis through fiction is different from communicating in other ways, like news or science? Uh, because, um, because we get bombarded by news every single day, or at least I do. Um, I read The Guardian all the time. I'm a classic Guardian reader, you know? Sort of liberal, would-be, intellectual. Um, I buy my coffee in a cup that I bring myself to, a, to, the, to the cafe and whatever. It's like these little tiny things because I'm bombarded by this information, like, you have to do this and you have to do this. But for the, the man on the street or the woman on the street, the people who don't really um, engage with these, with these news articles, they don't care, right? It's, it's not in interesting for them, it's not important for them. It's only important for me because I belong to this circle of people that, that makes me care about it and I make them care about it. It's like a self-sustaining care circle, you know? But like if I go home and I, I speak to my parents, they don't care about like uh, not using so many plastic bags or not using um, re disposable coffee cups or things like that. These are very tiny things, but the mentality is not there. But if you approach if you approach it through fiction, you can. It, it's like what I said on the panel. You can make it digestible. You can put it in terms that somebody understands, in the sense that it's entertaining, and. On the latent level, it's entertaining. On the manifest level, it makes them think. 
but they don't, they're not really thinking about it until afterwards. They'll read the novel and think, that was an interesting adventure story. But hopefully something will remain afterwards where they'll think, yeah, but why was that like that? And why do their lives suck so much? And why are there no animals? And why is this character carving a wooden elephant? Oh, it's because there are no elephants. And it's things like that where you can, you can play with expectations and you can, you can introduce ideas, but in a very non-threatening way. I think that's it, it's non-threatening. If you, if you hand people um, data, a lot of people don't know how what to do with it. It's, it's, it's like handing somebody something in Greek. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? I don't speak Greek. I don't speak scientist, you know? I mean, I'm not saying I can interpret scientists' ideas, but I, I understand what it means to be a human being and to be very terrified right now of what's coming and to hopefully translate that into a story that anybody can understand, I think. Which is why a lot of the, the novel is written in very simple sentences. Like for me, I really had to pare it back and make it um, as understandable as possible. And a lot of people have said it's stylized, which is fine. But it's, it's more about getting the message across to as many people as possible. If you look at, the, at the, your colleagues in the art community, do you see any sort of change going more to discussing these issues? Or? Um, to be honest, no. But that's Berlin, right? So my colleagues in the Berlin scene, they're very egotistical and self, self-centered. They, they just care about what they care about. Um, but coming here and speaking with uh, Peter and Osa and the, uh, the others, that's nice because then you do see that people are, are, are thinking about things and you're not alone, you're not isolated. Um, a lot of the time you do feel isolated as an, as an artist. Um, you're just working on your project and you think you get so lost in it in your own headspace. Like with my novel, I hated going back into that world sometimes because it was so bleak and because I didn't know if anybody cared. And a lot of people who I explained the plot to, they were like, well, that's not gonna sell. Why would anyone read that? It's depressing. It's like, well, that's kind of the point. Um, but speaking to people here, and I, I also went to the um, Fotografiska Museum yesterday. There was a really good um, exhibition by Jesper Waldenstein. Anyway, that's all, it's all got kind of climate overtones to it now. I think it is in general moving towards this sort of fear of the future. And it's, it's definitely playing into to, um, to the art that we consume today. You can just go on Netflix and you see that there's, there's like a new dystopian film every week. And that's, that's just a response to our fear of climate change, like our collective fear, because it sells because we're all terrified of it. But a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that. Um, so in a wider sense, yes, with my own community, no. What role do you think art has in solving this question? Um, well, like I said before, I think it's about um, adding a different voice into the mix, making the unpalatable palatable, whilst retaining this sort of red thread of discomfort throughout. Um, it's about cutting up this huge issue that affects everyone and making it digestible, taking one piece of it that people can swallow and understand. And then maybe that is enough for them to begin to change. It's like a, like if the mind is a repository, then, then, then the art is the key to unlock the door to perception, right? It's like, like what Aldous Huxley was doing in the forties. It's like what any dystopian novel does. It's like 1984. Why is that still on bestsellers list? It's because because it makes people understand what totalitarianism means. You can't just present someone the word to totalitarianism and, and the Wikipedia entry for it. They're not gonna, they're not gonna understand it, but if you present it in, within, the realm of, within the framework of fiction, then they're gonna, they will get it. And it's like The Handmaid's Tale as well. It's consistently at number one, and it came out, what, like 25 years ago? And now it's got this resurgence, and it's, that's what fiction, or that's what art is about, is making it palatable making it understandable. Thank you very much. Thanks.